Okay, everyone. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, and I'm so excited to see so many people. So my name is Adam Levine. I am an associate professor of emergency medicine here at Brown University and also director of our new humanitarian innovation initiative here at the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. And we are really pleased to sponsor this incredible event today on the Syrian refugee crisis in collaboration with Middle East studies here at the Watson Institute. Um, the Humanitarian Innovation Initiative was just launched this past October with the goal of bringing together academics and practitioners here at Brown University and around the world to talk about and figure out new ways to improve the delivery of humanitarian assistance uh, worldwide. We are sponsoring this speaker series that started off this spring with a panel on the Ebola epidemic that was held last, uh, was held in February. This is our second uh, event in the series uh, focusing on Syria, and we'll have a third event in April looking at the Colombian peace process and transitional justice there in collaboration with CLACS. So please look out for that event as well. So I'm going to start by introducing our speakers. We have two speakers on our panel today, uh, Dr. Sarah Tobin and Dr. Khaled Alamalji. We are going to start with Dr. Tobin, and uh, then uh, Dr. Khaled Alamalji will be joining us via Skype. We want everyone to hold their questions until uh, the end, and then both of the panelists will be able to answer questions. Um, the panelists will each speak for about 15 or so minutes, and then we'll have a good half hour or so for questions at the end. Um, so first, let me introduce uh, Dr. Sarah Tobin. She is the Associate Director of Middle East Studies at Brown University's Watson Institute and an affiliate faculty of our Humanitarian Innovation Initiative. Her own work explores transformations in religious and economic life, identi identity construction, and personal piety at the intersections of gender, Islamic authority, and normative Islam, public ethics, and authenticity. She has published widely and started new research with Syrian refugees in Jordanian camps. Her next book, The Politics of the Headscarf in the United States, is forthcoming in 2018. So thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you everyone for coming out. I'm delighted to be here. A uh, special thanks to Adam um, and to Seth, who's hiding in the back, for organizing and implementing such a wonderful event. Um, thanks to the Humanitarian Innovation uh, Initiative, as well as the Watson Institute for um, sponsoring the event. And special thanks to Khaled, who is coming uh, via Skype uh, to us today. Uh, I'm sure you all know his story, and I'm really excited to uh, and honored to be participating with him in this this wonderful event. So, Today I'm going to talk about Syrian refugees in Jordan. Uh, I have been doing research with Syrian refugees in Jordan since uh, the beginning. Uh, actually, I was just chatting the other day with a, a Syrian refugee who runs an NGO inside of the camp, and he asked how long I had been doing research. And I said, since uh, you know the days of, of Killian, so the, it's like a, a, a way to reference a shortcut to the, the earliest days. And he laughed, and he said, you know what we say about people like you? And I said, what's that? And he said, You've, you've been here since before the war. Uh, and so there is this sense that I've been around uh, the Syrian uh, refugee camps in Jordan for quite a while, in fact, longer than many of the Syrians themselves. Uh, it was lighthearted and, and a wonderful compliment, I thought, to um, the way that I was received by this particular refugee. So today I'm going to talk um, in sort of general terms. There's a lot to be said about Syrian refugees in Jordan. And so what I'm going to do is give a comprehensive kind of overview of the situation uh, currently in the country, um, especially as regards the camps. Um, so I'm not going to talk so much about urban refugees, but I will go through the, the different camps um, and some experiences that I've had in them. Uh, I do have other arguments that I'm developing that are more sort of theoretically interesting and uh, draw on different literatures, things like resilience or um, uh, neoliberalism and, and things of that nature. But really, today I, I'm going to focus more on the empirical data. And uh, I'm certainly happy to talk about some of the theoretical implications of it uh, during the Q&A. So the Syrian refugee crisis, as you know, is the largest humanitarian crisis of our time, um, by most es estimates, the largest since World War II. And most recently, estimates are that uh, nearly 3 million 
Syrian refugees have entered Turkey, and over a million have gone to Lebanon, with 250,000-ish going into Iraq. Um, and Jordan has taken in, by most estimates, between 700,000 and 1 million. The difference in numbers in this case is due to the number of people who have registered with UNHCR and those who have not. So those that have registered are approximately 655,000, but the government estimates that the real number is closer to a million. Um, then there's about 350,000 or so who have not registered. There's a number of reasons why people don't register. Uh, but that difference is something important to keep in mind when thinking about how to track refugees um, and to look out for them and care for them. Um, and in some instances also to monitor and, um, and to control. It's also important to note that uh, it's estimated that there are about 5,000 Syrian refugees who have entered Gaza um, and that they did so through Egypt. So at the beginning of the civil war and the crisis uh, in Syria, some Syrians went to Egypt where uh, there was not a governing body, the UN, um, UNHCR was not uh, established and set up in a way to support them. And so the Egyptian government didn't really know what to do with the Egyptians, uh, or sorry, with the Syrians in Egypt. And so they um, actually imprisoned them for a time as a way to try to sort of keep them and maintain them. Um, and when some of them were then subsequently released, of course, not for um, any kind of criminalization, but just as a, a holding kind of mechanism, uh, about 5,000 went underneath the tunnels in Rafah um, and into Gaza. So in the case of Jordan, there are five refugee camps. Um, there were six. And this constitutes about 15% of the refugees in the country. About 85% of the refugees uh, live in urban areas and are more difficult to track and, or to, um, to monitor, although, like I said, uh, as many as 700,000 total have registered with the UN. So the very first Syrian refugee camp uh, was called Second El Bashabsha, which is the Bashabsha home that they turned into. It's an, an apartment complex uh, that they essentially turned into a de facto refugee camp. They brought in Syrians there in um, the Rumfa area, I think. This should work. Yes. Uh, so the family is in the, the Rumfa area. The crossing is just right, right here. There's an official border crossing there that's obviously closed. Um, and the Dara region. Um, is where most of the refugees uh, immediately, at least, came from into to Jordan. And so this family sort of emptied their apartment complex uh, of Jordanians and Palestinians in Jordan and filled it with Syrian refugees. It has subsequently been closed. The Ministry of the Interior has closed it. But that was sort of the first attempt at encamping and providing for the Syrians in Jordan. The other camps include King Abdullah Park, which is nearby as well, currently housing approximately um, 5,000 refugees, so it's relatively small. The third is uh, the Emirates camp, uh, also housing about four to 6,000 uh, at various times. Uh, so they call it the Emirates camp, although there is a, uh, an Arabic name for it. But they call it the Emirates camp because it is essentially run and owned by Emiratis. And so Emiratis come in and they staff it. Um, they provide for the refugees. They feed them three meals a day and have cookies and snacks and coffee and tea available um, all day, every day. And so if you call it a five-star refugee camp, they get offended because it is a seven-star refugee camp. Thank you very much. Um, but you know, the, the refugees in the camp, despite uh, more favorable material conditions are frustrated and report frustration because they don't have a lot of control over these aspects of their lives. So um, as you students who live in the dorms can attest to, right, when you only have certain hours that you can uh, go eat a breakfast that is prepared for you, and then only certain hours where you could eat a lunch that is prepared for you, and then only certain hours where you could eat a dinner that's prepared for you, you begin to feel like you don't have a lot of control over some aspects of your life. Right? You're sort of subject to um, nice provisions, but someone else's provisions for you nonetheless. Uh, less. And then think about when you go home for the holidays, what a joy it is to have moms cooking, to have the traditions, the, um, the foods, the drinks that you've come to know and love as part of your own family's traditions. Uh, to be denied that, of course, uh, is a difficult kind of thing. So it's a, a double-edged sword, if you will, in this case. 
The next camp is Uzrak. So Uzrak uh, could house up to 100,000 people. Um, currently, it does not house nearly that many. Last estimates that I read said about um, 30,000 people. There was a large push just before uh, the end of 2016, in particular after Trump was elected, um, but prior to that as well as we were coming up on election season. Uh, by the Obama administration to bring as many Syrian refugees to the U.S. prior to inauguration as possible, in anticipation of some of the executive orders and things of that nature that have emerged since. Um, and they were doing it largely through the Azraq camp. Um, they would section off certain parts of the camp physically, and people who were going through the security process and the vetting process at the same time were being moved from sections of the camp into the next section of the camp. So it was seen as a kind of security, um, uh, an administration of security of the refugees in order to facilitate their movement as quickly as possible through the vetting kind of situation. Um, the camp continues, though, to house uh, a large number of people and uh, now, given the executive orders that we've received, uh, we're likely to do so for a while into the future. Cyber City is a camp I'll talk about in just a minute. Um, it's a camp for Palestinian refugees from Syria. And then the other camp that I will also talk about today is Zatari, which I'm sure um, most, if not all of you, have, have heard of. So I'm going to start with Zatari. Um, this camp was established, or sort of established, I guess. The, um, the first settlements around here um, began in late 2011 into the early part of 2012. And this map here is provided by the UN as of November of 2012. So you can see that there's some dense housing that's built up in this sort of northwest corner. This next image over to the right is the same camp space, as you can tell. Um, in January of 2013. So in two months, you go from this sort of settled housing area to this larger kind of um, encamped area that includes um, some spatial configurations that are more sort of um, planned and measured and uh, laid out. So that's just in the span of two months. Then moving to the bottom left-hand corner, you have February of 2013. So this is one month period from January to February. This is the beginning of February. This is the end of February. So we're talking about a span of November, December, January, four months um, to go from a camp that's just beginning at this size to a camp that has uh, very nearly reached capacity. This is what Zatari looks like today. It is a camp of approximately 100,000 people. Uh, the numbers have stayed relatively similar. Uh, that is because there are a large number of refugees that will come from Syria, take a rest, have a time with their family, and then return to Syria. So there is some turnover that way. It's also the case that as refugees have uh, migrated onto Europe or sought asylum in other countries, um, they have exited the camp. Some have moved into urban areas. So just as there's been an inflow of Syrians, there's also been an outflow out of the camp. Um, this map does show that there have been attempts to kind of uh, map it out and to um, create something that looks more like an urban city rather than this sort of chaotic camp uh, situation. And so they've named these districts, rather unfortunately, District 1, District 2, 3, um, 4, 5, there's 6, 7, coming all the way around to, yes, uh, District 12. So for those of you who have read The Hunger Games, it has this sort of uh, terrible echo to it. But nonetheless, that was still the, um, the plan of, of mapping that they, they started out with. There are a few things to note on this map. The primary camp entrance is up here in the northwest um, section, where the most densely populated area is. This area became the most densely populated because right here is the French hospital. And so people would initially come to this area and settle next to the French hospital, um, and then took to sort of jokingly call this main street from the main entrance in front of the French hospital the Champs-Élysées. So they call this street the Champs-Élysées. But even, um, even more so, they actually call it the, the Shams-Élysées, which is a play on the Arabic word for sham, which is the Arabic word for the Levant. So it's sort of like the Levantine d'Élysées. 
Um, so it shows a kind of linguistic um, lightheartedness at what is a, an incredibly difficult time for people. It has turned into a market street. So the entire street, uh, the, the Champs Elysees, is full of unregulated, unmonitored um, markets and shops that Syrians have opened. It has grown to such a large degree, the market has, that it has extended down this street, which is the Saudi street. That's named after a uh, assemblage of Saudi-sponsored schools and hospitals, um, kindergartens and things in this area. So these two streets have approximately 3,000 shops on them. You can buy anything in the shops. Um, you can change money. You can rent a wedding dress. You can buy a pet. Uh, you can buy falafel. You name it, it's all available. Um, turning, at least economically speaking, this refugee camp into a thriving kind of market. Um, so one sort of uh, theoretical point that merits uh, just a brief aside now, but we could, exp we could explore a little more in the Q&A, is that this is kind of a libertarian's dream. There's no regulation. There's no taxation. Um, and so what happens in these kinds of scenarios in which um, there's really no oversight and the populace is uh, shouldering the responsibility for developing themselves, if you will. A couple other things to note, um, near the camp entrance are the headquarters for the NGOs. So the NGOs are these blue buildings, um, and they are spread out throughout the camp. But the headquarters are all up here. And then next to that, down the road just a little bit, is the um, Jordanian government buildings. So these are called the headquarters um, area. When you first come into the camp, then this is the area that one is directed to drive down and to check in with the NGO or the, the government office, the Jordanian government office. Um, a couple other things of note, you can see this dark uh, line that goes around the outside of the camp. There are other maps that show it perhaps a bit more clearly. You can see it um, coming down this way and around. Uh, the Jordanian government has built a large trench that goes all the way around. That's what this black line is. Um, it is an effort to funnel traffic in and out of the primary camp entrance. So the refugees are able to come and go as they please. They don't need permissions. It is not a prison. However, they are trying to limit, the Jordanians are trying to limit the amount of smuggling that happens in and out of the camp of contraband or counterfeit goods or pornography or uh, alcohol or sort of morally uh, suspect kinds of, of things. And so if they funnel the movement of people and goods through one entrance, then they're better able to monitor what comes in and out. Um, in a couple of cases, I sat with the Jordanian government uh, officials as they were working with um, child support services and uh, youth, a uh, young male of uh, 14 years, had been caught several times smuggling alcohol in and out for his brother, uh, which was then being sold on a kind of a black market. And so there was this question of like, well, what do we do with the boy? He's quite young, but he's old enough to know better. He shouldn't be doing it. It was a kind of moral um, concern for people. Um, and then the other thing I'll note is that down at the the bottom of the camp, there are a number of other services. World Food Program, for example, does distribute bread every morning at 6 o'clock. They have a distribution site down here. They also have one uh, right in there. Um, and there are a number of kindergartens around. Save the Children has a number of sites around. Um, and there are playgrounds also. So an, a wide variety of NGOs spread throughout the camp. So this is an aerial view of Zatari. It is visually, I don't know if, um, Alex, if, uh, if you can turn the lights down just a little bit, that would be awesome. Um, visually, it's quite stunning. It is a one and a half kilometer by three kilometer sized camp housing 100,000 people. I mean, it's a city. And each of these uh, little tents there are, you know, one family sort of residence. Over time, the tents have been replaced with what are referred to colloquially as caravans. They are mobile home units that are about 10 by 10. Um, and families quickly discovered that they could and, and wanted to move their housing units to be near other family members. And so this, this large sprawl that you see um, is tent after tent and caravan after caravan of uh, housing units for this 100,000 people. Um, you can see when people have brought their caravans together, they've often organized it into a fashion that's similar to um, a, a household unit in Syria, where you might have three or four families around a central courtyard. 
So they would reorganize their caravans in that kind of fashion as well. You can see something similar with a mix of tents and caravan units um, down here on the bottom. By now, everybody has been converted to the caravan unit. This picture um, is, is from 2013. Um, and tents are available for sale on the black market, uh, if you're interested. Um, this view, by the way, so if you are sort of up in the air in a plane about here, looking towards the right, this is the view that you have. Okay. So I want to touch for just a minute on um, Palestinian refugees from Syria. They constitute a important but often uh, under-discussed aspect of the Syrian refugee crisis and the refugee movements. Um, in Syria, there were almost uh, half a million registered refugees. Uh, Palestinians in Syria had all rights of citizens except for citizenship. Um, so they weren't able to vote um, in local elections, for example, but they were able to be economically, politically, socially, culturally, otherwise fully integrated. There were a number of camps. Um, throughout the country. A couple of note are Yarmouk, which had about 150,000 people. It's been in the news. Uh, it was under siege for quite a long time. Um, at one of the worst points, perhaps not the worst point, the inhabitants who were under siege in Yarmouk uh, were unable to access any aid. No outside aid was brought in. Uh, the people were quite literally starving to death. Uh, and most people in Yarmouk were living on approximately 500 calories per day. Um, so there had been this sort of slow um, erosion of health and resulting in, in the loss of life for a number of people in Yarmouk. You might remember there's an image of, uh, that it was quite iconic now of the Syrian uh, refugee crisis, where there are buildings that are sort of falling apart and there's this, the street is just full, full of people. That is a scene from Yarmouk. Um, I, don't, I don't have it, but um, we could certainly pull it up if that was, uh, would be of interest. The other thing to note is Dara, which is a Palestinian refugee camp that was in the south of, of the country, um, very close to the Jordanian border. The Palestinians that were in the Dara refugee camp were some of the earliest targets by the Assad regime and came to Jordan quite early in the process. Um, in fact, the uprisings um, and the sort of Syrian wing of the Arab Spring began in the Dara region. Um, and that is, is where people came from into Jordan quite early on. So the Palestinian refugees that come from Syria into Jordan experience uh, particular hardships. They are not treated under the um, auspices of UNHCR, but rather under UNRWA, which is the UN agency that is responsible for the care and treatment and support of Palestinian refugees throughout their lifetimes. For many of the Palestinian refugees that I interviewed, however, they had been displaced multiple times. So they had been displaced from uh, Palestine, from the West Bank. Many of them had come through Jordan. And uh, at a time when Jordan was actually in the throes of a civil war uh, in the 70s, many of them went on to Syria, only to then be pushed back into, into Jordan. Uh, it's a, a devastating situation. The Jordanians, as I'll mention um, in a moment, do not treat the Palestinians coming from Syria as they do Palestinians who had come from the West Bank after 48 or 67 or 73 or at any other point in time. The Palestinians that come from Syria are now not able to access citizenship or rights of uh, free passage within Jordan. Their rights are very se severely limited. It's believed that there are about, according to this one, one map, uh, about 10,000. I've heard numbers and estimates that are much, much higher. Um, and I have heard that a number of Palestinian, because of the way that the Jordanian government does not recognize uh, their free passage and free movements, even as they do Syrian refugees, a large number have moved to the south of Jordan uh, on the border with Aqaba, uh, which is a port city in the country, uh, and have been subject to human trafficking um, and exploitation in the port city. So this is Cyber City. This is the refugee camp that was built for Palestinian, well, it wasn't built, it was rented and leased. It was established uh, as a refugee camp for Palestinians coming from, uh, from Syria. There's only approximately 400 people who live here, and they live in what is effectively a, um, a free zone, an economic free zone, where there would be otherwise migrant workers living and working in this factory. 
Um, it is on a factory grounds. It's, there's nothing operational. It's all sort of defunct um, uh, properties and um, sort of in disarray and um, deterior various states of deterioration. But within the compound more largely, there are other operating factories. Um, so there's a number of uh, Sri Lankans, Pakistanis, and other foreign workers who have uh, been brought into the area who are now living in buildings next to the Palestinian refugees from Syria. They, these 400 uh, PRSs, as they're sort of colloquially, colloquially referred to, live in a dormitory or the equivalent of a, of a dor dormitory. Uh, there's six stories. There are two wings on each story, and uh, each room is about the size of your dorm room, and it can house uh, typically two people, but it can house up to four, um, depending on a family size. Just like a dormitory, it has shared bathrooms, a men's room, and a women's room. Um, and a shared kitchen and wash facilities then on that floor. The, I don't have any pictures of, of people actually in general um, in this presentation to respect their privacy, uh, but in particular, Cyber City is considered by the Jordanian government to be of some security concern um, because they don't really know what to do with Palestinians from Syria in the country. Um, and so this is the temporary solution, at least they hope. Uh, okay, so just one uh, last point that I would like to discuss briefly um, is the, the berm, this area called the berm. So this is not a camp, uh, not an official camp by any means, um, but it is an area where refugees have become trapped, uh, quite literally trapped between Syria and Jordan. The space between the Syrian border and the Jordanian border in this area is about two miles. As of um, the end of 2015, the Jordanian government was still admitting between 100 and 300 people from this area per day. This area in Syria, by the way, is under ISIS control. And the Jordanians are worried about ISIS coming into Jordan via this pathway right here, via the berm, this two-mile um, pathway. There are 12,000 Syrians awaiting entry into Jordan as of the end of um, 2015. That number has grown significantly, which I will show you momentarily. Uh, aid at that point, at the end of 2015, was delivered by lorry trucks and distributed by the Jordanian military and military contractors. UN staff and NGO staff was not allowed to cross the Jordanian border into the berm. Only military and military subcontractors subcontract were. Um, the people in this area live without toilets, water, or electricities. electricity. Their dwellings are makeshift. Um, they have had major problems with rodents. A lot of the horror stories that I'd heard were about rats um, and small children. Um, MSF, uh, Doctors Without Borders, provides direct care, not indirect care. So there were a number of challenges um, that were raised about who could provide medical care. In the end, the UN was brought out um, to provide some health services, but largely the Syrians in the berm are left to their own devices. They don't have direct care in any form coming other than boxes of aid that, that were brought over by lorry truck. This image is as of May 2016. At this point, we now have 60,000 people living in this two-mile area between the Jordanian border and the Syrian border. In June 6 of 2016, a suicide bomber in a car killed six people and injured 14, um, and he struck a Jordanian military post. So this was the sort of Jordanians' worst fear, was that ISIS was going to come in the form of refugees um, and um, enact uh, a killing against the Jordanians. And so at that point, the Jordanians sealed the border completely. They no longer took the 100 to 300 Syrians through this um, anymore. And the only way that they were able to deliver aid at that point as a result was uh, by crane delivery. So they would drive a crane uh, over to the border and literally lift the aid off of the truck, turn the arm, and drop it. That was the only way the aid was getting in. This is what the berm looks like today. And now actually is believed to be sort of two camps or two camp-like settlements. One is Rukban, which is the area, this two-mile area. And then Hadalat is on the Syrian side. So the Syrians have now effectively closed off uh, exiting through this area um, on the Syrian border. In, sorry. 
Um, in 2016, uh, the Russians and the Assad regime bombed this side of the Syrian border um, and have killed a number of people. Um, to try to develop more safe housing, Syrians in the berm and on the Syrian side have uh, started to dig holes underground and dig caves um, as a way to try to sort of um, protect themselves from the bombardment. Um, and at this point, aid delivery is only happening um, either via the crane or through military contractors and subcontractors. Very recently, this is the last point, um, World Vision has come under a lot of criticism because they have uh, sub, they've contracted with an organization who has subcontracted with a Syrian militia to protect um, the aid distribution that they've been making. And so it raises some of these um, moral questions as well as theoretical questions about um, complicitness, about um, political economy of aid distribution, as well as concerns about um, involvement of uh, what are seen by many um, states to be terrorist organizations. So in conclusion, um, in addition to these morally kind of confounding concerns that we have, I think the lessons from the Syrian refugee crisis continue to be questions of responsibility for the international community, not just within the Middle East, but beyond, um, making us all wonder when will it end and pray hopefully soon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Tobin. So I'm very excited to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Khalid Amalaji, who's a Syrian physician that was born, raised, and completed his medical studies in Aleppo, Syria. He began his specialty training in head and neck surgery in Syria in 2008, but was unable to complete his training due to the conflict. Instead, he has dedicated his efforts since the beginning of the conflict to humanitarian assistance. He served as the administrative coordinator for the mass polio vaccination campaign in northern Syria in 2014, which vaccinated over a million children against polio. And in 2014, he founded a local humanitarian organization in Turkey that has been working to help Syrian refugees fleeing from the conflict. He began his master's of public health here at Brown University in 2016 and now serves as, our, as a fellow of our humanitarian innovation initiative. He is joining us now by Skype from Turkey. Thank you for joining us, even though I know it's way past midnight where you are right now. No, I'm happy. I'm so happy. Thank you for having me first, and thank you, Dr. Adam. Um, um, actually, um, I'm very honored to be with you today, and uh, thanks for everyone uh, with us today. And uh, of course, uh, and. Uh, I'm always and I'm also happy, Sarah, to be uh, to to present with you, my friend. So, um, I'm, um, since uh, 2012, I've been in uh, in Turkey. Uh, I fled I fled from Aleppo. Uh, I've been arrested like for six, six months in Syria, and then I was released. Then I was wanted again. I fled Aleppo in 2012 in April. Um, I, I came to Gaziantep, which is the uh, uh, city like 50 kilometers from the borders, um, uh, from, uh, the, from the Syrian borders in Turkey. Uh, um, I'm, I was from the first Syrian like uh, citizens came, coming to Gaziantep because most of the Syrians were going to the uh, uh, to Hatay uh, governorate, which is beside Idlib uh, city, uh, Idlib governorate in Syria, where the uprising was uh, very like uh, uh, active uh, in 2012. So uh, at that time, the patients, uh, of course, uh, let's like uh, let's give us let's give some uh, figures about the refugees. Of course, I think uh, just to, re to remind everyone that there is almost uh, now 60, uh, almost 65.3 million refugees in the world. Uh, I think uh, there is 4.9 million uh, Syrian refugees who are registered. Uh, and of course, Turkey uh, is the top hosting country with 2.5 million 
uh, and uh, they are registered. And I think the, 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 the number by the Turkish authorities are almost uh, 2.9 million registered. Of course, uh, and there are more unregistered in Turkey. Um, uh, in Turkey, there's almost 26 camps, official camps, to host Syrian uh, refugees. Uh, the, the total number is almost a quarter million uh, Syrians in the ref in the camps, and the rest of them are, uh, and the rest of the number is all of them are outside the camps. Uh, the support in the camps uh, since the first day was actually what was uh, better than the uh, level of the the the, the support uh, either in Lebanon or Jordan. Actually. Uh, most of the camps are, uh, since the first uh, day, was uh, uh, were uh, like uh, caravans. Uh, there are some camps like uh, it's tents, but uh, it's uh, equipped uh, very well with the the, 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 the all the services and the, uh, the health facilities uh, and schools. Um, the total number of uh, uh, for the ca the, the, the uh, Syrians in the camps uh, for the kids, I think it's uh, uh, I'm sorry for all the, the Syrians in, 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 in Turkey, there are there's almost uh, 500,000 children uh, and they were provided with uh, education either in the camps or outside the camps. Uh, the uh, there was uh, according to the uh, Turkish authorities, 178,000 Syrian babies have been born in Turkey since uh, the, the the mid of 2011. Um, uh, in the camps, uh, the people, the the Syrian uh, refugees in the camps, they came mostly from. Uh, Araka, Governorate, uh, Derzor, Hasake, Aleppo mainly, and Idlib, and also from Hama and Homs. There are some refugees from Damascus. Uh, specifically, when there was some kind of evacuation for uh, for some cities in the last year, forced actually forced evacuation. Uh, after a massive like destruction of those uh, besieged areas, like Daraya and Madami and other couple of uh, Wadi Barada, most of them they fled to 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 Idlib governorate, and uh, a lot of them actually crossed the border to Turkey. So uh, uh, the the situation in the camps uh, is good. The Turkish authorities uh, are providing health services. Uh, and uh, education, food, and shelter for everyone in the camps. Outside the camps, uh, all Syrians are covered uh, for the health insurance. Like, uh, as you are a Syrian, you can go to the hospital, you can go to the emergency department. Even cancer patients, cancer patients can go to the hospitals and get medication for long-term courses. Uh, so, actually, I know a lot of patients. Uh, they are they were crossing the border f to take the their 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 doses and to go back. So, um, in 2012, uh, the, the 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 difference between Turkey and the other countries is the language. The Turkish language is like totally like it's 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 another language. So, uh, the, the 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 main barrier, the main barrier was. The, the, the communication between the uh, Syrian citizens and uh, refugees with the Turkish, uh, if you can say, the, 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 in the camps, uh, management, in the hospitals, in the market, everywhere. So for us as humanitarian workers, we, we, uh, since like 2012, I see a huge difficulty when uh, all the injured and patients coming to the hospitals and they cannot communicate with doctors and nurses, specifically in, 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 in the emergency department where they were like injured or burned or, or, or like heavily uh, like uh, 
uh, injured and they need to communicate with doctors, but there was no way to communicate. So that was the first thing that we have done, actually, to to uh, bring some support to to staff, like uh, a, a huge team of transla translators in all the hospitals, and actually on shifts. So some some translators were sleeping actually in the hospitals. Uh, in, uh, especially uh, in days that were like heavy shelling in Aleppo or Idlib. So there was an influx of uh, patients uh, coming from Syria into the, crossing the borders to the Turkish uh, facilities. Actually, Turkish uh, uh, authorities, they sometimes with the huge pressure, they allowed even the Syrian ambulances coming from the opposition areas to cross the borders, carrying the patients directly to the hospitals. So there was a huge like cooperation. Um, uh, according to the Turkish authorities, uh, we can talk about uh, almost uh, uh, 780,000 operations have been carried out. Uh, almost 20 million outpatient services have been rendered. Uh, 940,000 hospital patients were treated. This is the the the, uh, the the official numbers from the uh, Department of Emergency. It's called the the AFAD. It's the 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 Turkey's Disaster and Emergency Management, who are managing the all the affairs of the refugees in in Turkey, the Syrian refugees in Turkey. Um, actually. Uh, the, the, the Syrian refugees are allowed to work lately in Turkey officially, so all the employers can uh, uh, hire Syrian refugees uh, officially in, in Turkey. And uh, even outside the camps, all the Syrians can go to hospitals, uh, schools, and, uh, that, and that, that was for free. So, um, I think we, yeah, uh, the municipalities, uh, Shaitis and the Red Crescent, which was called Kizilai in, uh, in Turkey, uh, they were supporting the, uh, the Syrian families outside the camps, uh, like in different ways, and supporting them uh, like by everything, um, as, uh, of course, as much as they can. And lately, they received uh, some support from, I think, the UN, uh, the, the, the Europe or uh, the UN agencies, uh, to support them for cash by ca by a card, and it was like uh, I think it's just for the last six months for specific families who needed support. But in general, Turkey afforded almost 20 million to 20 billion dollars for the Syrian refugees in the last six years, whereas they got only half billion dollars from the international community. So it's, this is according to the uh, officials, uh, the Turkish uh, officials, that they spent almost uh, 20 billion dollars on the Syrian refugees, while they get only like uh, from the international community, they got only half billion dollars. Um, I think um, for the uh, now, um, I don't know if you know that uh, Turkish authorities they start now to give uh, citizenship to a lot of Syrians now. So uh, they were accepting uh, applications from the Syrian refugees uh, and uh, to, to make, uh, actually to, to make it easy for people to work more because it's the, even the permission to work in Turkey was uh, only for the like 10% like of the uh, job opportunities like uh, for in each governorate can be offered for the Turk, uh, Syrian refugees. So no, now they open the door for the professionals and the, the professions and the doctors, uh, engineers, and like huge margin of the uh, um, Syrian uh, refugees here to get the, the, the to apply for the Turkish uh, citizenship. Um, this is in general, and uh, of course uh, the most populated uh, cities in, in Turkey with Syrian refugees are Gaziantep, Urfa, uh, Hatay, which is Antakya, and uh, Istanbul, uh, Adana, Mersin. Uh, those are the, the, the most popular. In Gaziantep, where I am now, there's almost 400,000 Syrian 
citizen in this city. Um, it was almost 1.8 million before the, the, the 2011, and now you can add almost like uh, half million uh, Syrians uh, in this city. Um, I think uh, we talked about like uh, almost everything, but if uh, we can we can we can open the, uh, the the discussion now. If I forget anything, please just let me know so I can answer any question you want. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Khaled. So I'll have Sarah come up now. And just to let you know how the Q&A will work, um, Seth will be going around with the microphone. And so if you have a question, you have to speak into the microphone. Otherwise, Khaled won't be able to hear you. And so please wait to ask your question until the microphone comes to you. Um, and I will pick people out. And so we'll have a nice solid half hour of discussion. Um, do we have to be at this podium mic or do those so, work yeah, as well? Yeah, Sarah's going to be at the podium mic and then yeah, Fantastic. Make sure you speak in the mic and she'll be good to go. Up. Yeah, you know, it's amazing. I'm reminded by the things that we've heard from Sarah and Khalid about how while the United States argues over whether to take 10,000 Syrian refugees or not, uh, the countries of Jordan and Turkey and uh, Lebanon are hosting millions of refugees and, in addition to that, spending billions of their own dollars on hosting those refugees. And so it really puts things in perspective. And I think it shows one of the, the trends or truisms of humanitarian response in general in that most humanitarian aid is provided locally and regionally around the world. And only a small portion of it involves uh, international organizations uh, bringing aid to people from places like the U.S. And so it's really important to think about that. And one of our goals with the Humanitarian Innovation Initiative is really thinking about how we build up local capacity in the places that are actually providing that aid to the people around them. So without further ado, I will start taking questions now from everyone. Are you going to have that? I think, yeah, I think I need to use both of them. OK. Hi, good evening, good morning. Um, I'm curious to know how much freedom refugees in Turkish camps have to come and go. Yeah, actually, um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, great. So, yeah, I'm, I, sorry, I, I, this, this point is in the, on the paper, but I just forget to, <laughs> to mention it. So, yes, they, are, they have full freedom to, to, to even to go out the camps, to work, to, of course, as as uh, much as the 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 opportunities are allowed in each uh, governorate, but all of them are allowed to go out of the uh, the camps. They have their schools, their facilities in the camps, and they, if they it's needed. They are referred to more advanced health facilities, but they can go out. They can go to 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 visit anyone, and they can spend uh, time outside outside the camps, it's even for hours or for days. But they have not to be away for a long time. But it's 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 comfortable as uh, in in this regard. Um, hi, I have a question for both speakers. It's kind of two, two questions. First is religion-wise, how is, um, how free are people to practice religion uh, within the camps and outside of the camps? And the second question is if there is any kind of social inequity or religious inequity um, happening because of refugees coming in and sort of like having different practices or something like that. Like this is something that I don't really find anywhere online and I think it's an important matter to consider. Thanks. Yes, Sarah, you can, it's okay, you can go ahead. Okay. Uh, so in the case of Jordan, uh, nearly all of the refugees are Sunni Muslims. Uh, there are very few refugees that are not uh, Sunnis. So in terms of religious inequity, um, 
well, okay, so freedom to practice religion, it all fa falls under the same Jordanian law as Jordanians um, and Palestinians in Jordan practice um, their religious life, which is under the Ministry of Endowments, Wazir uh, al-Qaf. And so they have to abide by the same laws as um, uh, non-camp kinds of uh, mosques and, and practices. Um, I can talk more about those in detail if you want to know, but um, it's essentially that they're subject to the same kinds of, of laws. So in terms of religious inequity, there's some for those who are not Sunni Muslims, but there aren't that many Sunni Muslims, and they were prioritized uh, in asylum cases. Um, so Christians got moved out of Zatsuri, for example, very quickly. Um, in terms of social inequity, actually I've written an article uh, about the political economic formations within Zatsuri that I can direct you to, uh, but they do have a kind of localized formation where some people become power brokers and then how they uh, become power brokers and then use that power becomes very much a part of how um, the refugees get resources and how they keep them within the camp setting. Yeah, I think, uh, I think the same for, for Turkey. Even uh, uh, when we talk about the, the government rates in the east, uh, Turkey, the borders are uh, dividing some uh, the, the, the those government rates on the both sides of the borders, uh, but they have the same uh, the, the, the mosaic or the, 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 the structure of the society. So the Kurds, they move to the the, the parallel uh, governorates on the other side, where are the majority of the people there, uh, like uh, like as a, uh, the, the 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 majority of the Kurds are on the other side. Uh, most of them are like uh, Sunni Muslims, and the, there was no uh, problem actually to 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 integrate in the society. But again, for the problem of the language. Uh, the, uh, on the western side of the borders, uh, the, the Aleppo and, and Idlib and Raqqa, uh, <clears throat> yeah, specifically in Raqqa, they have only, even in Orfa, there are Arabs, like uh, Turks and Kurds. So, and uh, most of them are like uh, Sunni Muslims. So, the, 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 the integration, the, the integration between the the refugees and the people there or even the camps or outside the camps was 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 it was easy and people were welcoming till now are supporting and welcoming everyone uh netlib and uh and aleppo uh, like they were uh, moving to gaziantep and hatay uh, the same the same it's a um, um, most of them are Sunni Muslims, and uh, they were uh, welcome in, in, in those uh, two uh, governorates. Uh, of course, uh, the, 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 there is a awareness always like inside the camps and outside the camps uh, by the Turkish authorities to, uh, to do some kind of uh, uh, this uh, activities between the refugees and the Turkish citizens, so they can create this kind of cooperation and, and I'm sorry, uh, respect. So I think uh, the, that, that this point was was uh, really okay in, 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 in the, for the last like five years. Thank you. Uh, this question is for both of you, and I'm curious about the mindset of the refugees, uh, both in Jordan and Turkey. Uh, do they see their displacement as something that is temporary and hoping to go back to Syria, or do, oh, excuse me, uh, can you hear? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, do they see their displacement as something that is temporary and uh, hoping or intending to go back to Syria once the conflict is over, or are they uh, more <laughs> intent on, on assimilating to the new the new country and way of life. And I know that they're granting citizenship in Turkey. So I'm just uh, curious to see if there's any difference or anything you could tell me on that. Yes. yes. Go ahead, Sarah. OK. Uh, so in the case of Jordan, um, initially, so back in the days of Killian, uh, before the war started, uh, the initial response 
was that the refugees were very keen to return to Syria. I mean, that was the anticipation. And so there, the responses to offers of aid and um, even to the camp setting itself was one of often of agitation, uh, sometimes antagonistic kinds of relationships because they didn't think they would be there that very long. And so they were agitating um, as part of an effort to sort of uh, have a, a better place in, in the hopes of returning. But over time, as uh, the war in Syria continues to worsen, the refugees have come to see that they won't be returning to Syria in uh, the near future. And so it's kind of divided. Uh, there are, are many who see themselves as now being a refugee. Um, I recently saw a statistic that the average person who is a refugee is a refugee for 17 years. Um, and so the Syrians in Jordan are starting to feel that that might be closer to their time frame. I mean, hopefully not, but uh, entirely possible. And then there are others who say, well, if we're not going to return to Syria, we don't want to stay in Jordan um, and have left Jordan in hopes of, of moving um, oftentimes through back through Syria into Turkey uh, or Lebanon um, and into Western countries. Yeah, actually, we can we can divide this uh, the, to talk about like the the professions, technicians, and the businessmen. Like specifically, when we are talking about Aleppo, Aleppo is the industrial capital of 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 Syria with the four million uh, citizens in Aleppo before. So uh, those people they they tried hard for the last like five years not to establish. A, like a major business outside Syria, because all like most of them, they were telling us that if we start a major business outside, we will never come back. And this business and money, we really have to invest it inside Syria, not outside Syria. But like with the time now, with six now six years, I see a lot of them. They start having their business in Egypt, in Turkey, in Jordan, in Lebanon. And with the with the with the trend that they might not come back, uh, they love to come back. But now with the less security, even with the more maybe security uh, and um, the, the 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 situation will be changed soon. I hope. But as uh, soon as you start a business outside, you will stay outside. If the same for the professions and the, the technicians. They will not come back till the security situation will be better. Uh, sometimes if they like their their kids are raising raised there, the language and the they, they, they start their education and everything, they will start having the difficulties to come back with the schools are affected and the, the, the health sector is closed totally, like the health system is totally collapsed in most of the areas in the north. So it will be difficult. So um, the infrastructure like uh, in, in, in Syria is almost like 40, like 40 to 50 percent of it, like it's now destroyed. So uh, um, I think it's difficult. But for Syrians, I think no one, just literally no one, if he get the chance, uh, will not come back. He, they will come back. They want to come back. And even uh, when they see that there is any any chance to with a safe place and some like basic school and education for their kids, they will come back. Uh, we have a huge uh, number of of uh, people who are working on agriculture, and they moved, and they will they are willing to come back. The, Syria was a huge like uh, we we are known with the agriculture uh, economy. We, we have the, the 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 industry. We have the technicians, and they are very good in the Turkey like in the Turkish market or in the Lebanese market. They are working very well, and they are doing a very great job, and uh, they are willing also to go back, but. The security issue is a very important, I, uh, I think. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I heard of this conference and I wanted to come. I'm a Syrian American living in Rhode Island all my life. My family are Christians from Aleppo. Uh, my two questions are. Hmm. Uh, since the government taking control of Aleppo, how has that changed the refugee uh, numbers 
coming, leaving the country or coming back into the country. And secondly, that uh, to apply for refugee status, you need to apply with the UN. Are there UN, any UN representatives in these camps that many Syrians um, who want to try to apply uh, can't apply? There is no embassies or anything from the United States in the country, so they would have to go outside the country or to a UN uh, facility to apply for refugee status, which, as we know, takes over two years to be vetted and, and may take even longer now. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, actually, the the, uh, the registration was uh, for, for Turkish authorities. They consider Syrians as guests, as guests, not refugees. Like, of course, it's it's uh, the, the all the aspects of refugees, but they. Uh, honoring the Syrians by calling them guests. Uh, all of the Syrians are allowed to register in, in the UN agencies. It's not easy. It's not uh, everywhere. Uh, actually, in Gaziantep, people, they don't know where is the office of the, the UNHCR. Uh, it's open, closed, like, periodically. They, nobody knows when. And uh, and sometimes they, they, they in, in Killis on the borders, they say, hey, who want to go to Canada? So come, just register. So actually, like by chance, you go and you, you, you put your name, like suddenly, like after four months or five months or six months, they call you to come and for interview. And some people, they are registered since six years with the IOM or the, the UNHCR, and they didn't hear anything. So it's, it's not uh, like organized. Uh, but uh, this is I'm talking about the the, the UN uh, like uh, refugee process. Um, we heard about people who registered, succeeded in registering, but uh, they've been like waiting for four or five years and they didn't hear anything. And we hear about people who registered from six months, they processed the interviews and they left. Of course, like Sarah said. You, we like we heard and we knew that there's some difference between the sometimes in, in choosing uh, those refugees and families according, like unfortunately according to to specific things like religion. So um, uh, we know that, uh, but uh, in general the whole process is is not good. It's not organized. Yeah. So this is a point and of, of course, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, there, there is part of the question that 100, 150,000 left Aleppo, the, part, the opposition part of uh, Aleppo, when there was a forced evacuation, actually, under the whole, like, the, the, the massive, uh, like, uh, horrible uh, shelling uh, last December. Uh, so... Uh, it's just like a few neighborhoods, but there was like between 150,000 and 200,000. They fled Aleppo and they went uh, into Idlib in the opposition areas. There are some people and families. They are coming from other governorates and even from outside Syria. Some of them they are coming back to Aleppo um, because of the like relatively more. Uh, Maybe secure uh, or stable situation there, but it's not. It's not uh, almost totally safe, but it's better than before. But at the end, there are more than like quarter million. Uh, they fled this part of the opposition areas. The government, the regime of Syria, they forced them to flee because if they stayed there, they would be killed by the militias that they were besieging, like uh, surrounding those areas and chilling those areas. Yeah. So there is a point of difference between Turkey and Jordan, it sounds like, on the issue of registration. Uh, in the case of Jordan, every night the um, equivalent of like the National Guard and the army would go along the Syrian border with Jordan and collect all of the refugees that had come over the border uh, and would bring them into a processing center. They would go through the processing center and at the end um, they would get medical treatment during that process. All of their documents would be checked. Um, their stories would be verified. Uh, their children would even receive like vaccines um, and lice treatments um, in that process. I mean, it was quite extensive. Uh, but by the end of it, then they would be placed in uh, Zatari or in another refugee camp. 
Um, and so the process was very streamlined. Uh, it was relatively uh, efficient as these things go. Uh, they did try to, of course, prioritize people with compromised health. Um, I mean, in the stories of, of people that I spoke with um, who would walk from, like, the Dada region or from southern Syria, you know, 10, 15, 20 kilometers, pushing a wheelchair, carrying an infant. Um, I mean, you might recall there was this uh, story about a large group of Syrians who had walked across the desert overnight in the middle of the night, and um, little Marwan, this um, little Syrian boy, was walking by himself, and eventually he was reunited with his family, but in the chaos, um, the, the boy was separated from his parents, and I mean, I heard story after story of people who spent that time only to, to feel like the Jordanians had really helped them by picking them up and bringing them through the refugee uh, processing center with the UN. And we'll take a question on this side. My question was for Holland, so maybe somebody else should go first. Impressed with the Wi Fi connection so far. In yeah. Hi. <laughs> um, so this question is for Holland, um, and you've spoken a lot about how um, kind of welcoming the Turkish government um, and people have been. Um, did you find that coming to the U.S., I guess Brown and Providence is kind of an, an interesting microcosm, but did you find kind of all the xenophobia that's been going on um, in the last couple months shocking, and, and did you find that people from the U.S. who don't know much about the conflict would assume that other countries would be um, not welcoming as they have been? Um, like, did you find that Americans are surprised um, with how welcoming uh, Turkish and other governments have been of Syrian refugees? Yeah. Uh, first, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> Good. We miss you in biostats. <laughs> we miss you all. So, um, yes, uh, I think um, um, we are surprised. My wife is, <laughs> she's, she's, uh, my wife, she's um, uh, almost, um, she's Syrian, she's from Aleppo, but uh, her mother is from Montenegro. She, she spent some years in Montenegro. She, like, she lived here and there and everywhere, and uh, me too. But uh, we were like uh, expecting uh, something in the U.S. and we saw it and we felt it and we we loved the the, the time that we spent in in, in 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 Providence. She's there. She's in Providence now. I think not to no, no today she's in New York. But uh, uh, the <laughs> but um, we love the time. I, I I hope to come back and to 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 complete the the, the, the my master as soon as possible. Uh, the thing is is uh, is happening now in the U.S. It's something transient. Don't worry. I, I mm -hmm. think everything will be okay. Um, uh, it, it, like like you know, um, something has been built for the last 100 years. Nothing will 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 shake it. The, so I, I, every you time are more is optimistic uh, than many of us. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, 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 like good people everywhere. So uh, in the U.S., don't don't. don't the, I, every time I'm talking to my friends and they are telling me, "Oh wow, we we didn't use to this, and this is not our values. This is not our principles." Yes, yes, this is not yours. But <laughs> things happen, and uh, and it will not stay for 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 a long time. And then then the people who are calling like uh, immigrants or refugees as bad. Maybe they don't know them. Maybe they 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 have this like uh, maybe we as as society we couldn't treat our uh, 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 each other well. It's not the, the the responsibility of the government of the U.S. to 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 tell the people how to act. This is our all responsibility as society, and half of the society decided that this is the administration. So so we 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 it's not the 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 the, the president. Uh, for me, for myself, I'm 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 I'm, thinking, uh, I'm talking about myself and maybe my my wife also. She thinks the same that this is not the president only like mentality or or or, or orientation or his point of view. This is this is it's just, uh, uh, some kind of of of, of uh, if you look at the Europe now, we have some kind of also the same trend now against immigrants and refugees 
And uh, I think it's the responsibility of the society to, to approach each other and to talk more in a very open mind way. It's not a, it's, 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 uh, it's, I think it's uh, everybody's responsibility uh, and very in a very, very responsible and peaceful way and as soon as possible to, to, to show that uh, every country can have these problems. Refugees will be out of their, their countries. People, they will be out of their country. It's not their choice but it, it, it happened most of the time and we have to stand by them because no one knows when your country can be in, in a problem and the others will help you at that time. So this is, this is a, a, like a mutual responsibility of everyone. Yeah. Shukran Khalid. Thank you for offering us comfort here. <laughs> um, is there a question? No? Okay, then over here. Sorry. Hi, nice to meet you, Halit. Um, my name is Maltam. I'm from Turkey. I'm a Persian academic, and I just received a message about you <laughs> uh, that you may need help in Turkey. You know, the message reached me uh, from Istanbul that 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 um, you're stranded there and that you need help. Is, is that it? <laughs> um, Thank you. Thank you. No, I'm serious. This, you know. Yeah, I, I, uh, absolutely. Like this, this uh, I have. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Like uh, I've been here since like uh, four to five years, and uh, for, like for, like uh, I'm lucky with having a lot of Turkish friends mm -hmm. and even the Syrian like uh, families. I have some relatives here. Uh, they have been here since like uh, a while. So I'm good. I'm good so far. So uh, and absolutely, if I need any help, I will let you know. <laughs> no, the some of the NGOs want to want to contact you. It's, can seem to find you, and I'm very shocked that I come here and I see you right in front of me. Uh, but, but uh, anyway, it's very happy to meet you. But uh, so I'll talk to Sarah about connecting you with some of those people who want to meet you yeah, and who yeah. want to be the NGOs in in Turkey and the, those those people who are um, very very um, active in helping the Syrian refugee situation in oh, Turkey. Oh, yeah, I'm I'm happy to 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 talk to anyone. Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, Khaled, uh, can you explain um, exactly what is keeping you from re-entering the U.S. and what you might need to re-enter? This might help. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, but before, but but I also have another question. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, I wasn't sure if I should have asked it, but you know, he looks very nice, and he gave us hope. So, um, <laughs> um, you know, in in in, I, you've been very nice also to Turkey. Thank you for being so nice to our country. Uh, but at the same time, the whole deal of offering the ci uh, citizenship and so on and so forth to the Syrians that are that uh, I, about four million now is actually uh, something that the government is looking forward to with the upcoming um, referendum on the constitutional change that will change Turkey into a dictatorship. So. Are, I'm sure the Syrians are aware of this. Those the, the people that I talk to are are, but what do you what do you think about that? And would that change the um, Syrian existence or the the feelings mindset about the Syrian existence in in in, in Turkey? Good luck with everything. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I think uh, Sarah, your question was uh, about uh, again, please quickly. Well, uh, I think Meltem is asking also uh, what we can do to help, because we know that there are real practical limitations keeping you from returning yeah, to Providence, yeah. returning to your wife, okay. your child-to-be, yeah. um, and what we can do to help, um, help you get what you need to get back to Providence. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, just wish me good luck, and that's. <laughs> uh, I'm I'm waiting. Uh, the, uh, I, I left the U.S. in the first of the January. I the next just right the next day I knew later that I lost my visa. Why I don't know why. Uh, my process like to get the original visa like uh, took two months. So I think uh, and I spent directly 
the whole semester in the U.S., so I don't know what is the new thing that they discovered. Anyway, so uh, I lost the visa, and but they told me that uh, in Turkey that they told me we do, we don't know why uh, the senator reads in in Rhode Island contacted the State Department. They don't want to share anything, but they said, but he can just directly apply. And of course, uh, it's not only me in January before the executive order. A lot of uh, Syrians and Middle Easterns lost their visas when they left the U.S. Uh, of course, and they were allowed to apply, but of course, they know that it will be uh, like halted or, or, or stopped by the, ex the first executive order and now the second one. Uh, anyway, but, um, I have my application in the, in the, uh, the new application in the consulate, but it's now like stopped and then re like uh, they continue again, then they stopped again. So I think it's... Uh, the, 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 it's it's very difficult to anticipate what 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 uh, what's the timeline or where, when I can get or even if I will get again the visa, but I hope that uh, the the but uh, I'm sorry the the Brown University the president uh, the the provost office Marisa everyone is helping the dean folks in the school. Uh, Senator Reed in the in the in Rhode Island the governor uh, she called me she's very nice. Uh, uh, everyone <laughs> called me. They, they called my wife. They are trying to support, they're giving legal support, and communicating with the consulate every week. So everything is 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 is, is has been done uh, very well. But we are waiting. Uh, so uh, yeah, wish us good luck with this. Uh, for the Tur Tur Turkey, I think. Uh, uh, first, the, 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 in, uh, everything on hold for uh, regarding the citizenship before the referendum. So nothing will be changed before the referendum. Nothing. This is first. Second, who are uh, for offered the citizenship are almost like now. Uh, I think they are um, yeah, thousands and uh, like a few thousands. And uh, again. This is a solution for many problems that they were facing, that the Turkish authorities were facing with the Syrians who are working with the humanitarian NGOs, who are working with the other. Uh, so there is a specific number of uh, expats or foreigners who are allowed to work on the, with the humanitarian NGOs. By giving citizens, citizenship to the Syrians, they are allowed to work as Turks in those humanitarian uh, NGOs with no problem for the NGOs. This is a specific narrow uh, thing I'm talking about. You are talking about the huge picture. Yes, uh, there, there are more than like uh, three millions are registered in, in, in Turkey. If we would give the citizenship for a lot of Syrians, there will be like change in the demographic picture of Turkey. And this is, this is obvious. But it, now we are talking about thousands and it will be after the referendum. Your, your notes about the referendum itself, I, I'm Syrian, I have nothing to do with that. Of course, you have your concerns. I have my concerns. I love Turkey. I love this country. I love uh, the, the hospitality. I love the, the charities, uh, the people. They were crying for the Syrian people, and they, they, they were trying to help. There, uh, there are many good things in the Turkish societies. Uh, I think... Uh, with the many problems happening in the area and the regions, we cannot focus on like a person or an action and say this is wrong and this is uh, right. It's comparatively, it's relatively. We have to compare things to know what's wrong and what's right. You can you, you can see what's like uh, like uh, where our rules are applied and at the but we see like uh, where like. Again, you cannot. Uh, we cannot judge anything now uh, without comparing it to other countries. Unfortunately, you can see the the the, the other like uh, countries, and don't, I don't want to name any country. But uh, yes, you are right about your concerns. I am con concerned about this. I love the the, the Turkey and the the the, the way the, of the civilian societies work and the the people and how they talk. And I don't want to them to lose any freedom that they have. So, uh, and but I, I believe in the Turk, uh, Turkish society and people that they can change in a very peaceful way and call the, the president if they think that this is this is not the right thing to do. And uh, they, they they are creative that they can reach some kind of a way to 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 do that. So if 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 if, if they can ch convince themselves, there is a referendum. And they can say no or yes at the end. Yeah.
the shakular. <laughs> Hi, um, thanks for uh, giving us all your insight. That was uh, always great to hear about how people feel on the other side of the world. Um, so building on that, I guess, that last part of that question, I wanted to uh, ask you about uh, the perception of a lot of the refugees in Turkey and maybe a lot of the refugees in, uh, in Syria that you might have been in contact with. Uh, sorry, I, I suppose displaced people in Syria. Um, uh, I'm from Turkey as well, actually, and historically, while I was growing up, there was a lot of faith uh, that we had towards, uh, we had and still have towards the United States as, as kind of a, uh, something to hold up very, very highly and a, a refuge almost, in a sense, in certain, in certain ways. It was, it was in the curriculums at some points and as a, as a, uh, as a country that was modeled uh, somewhat in the European uh, ideals and values, we, we looked up to the United States uh, very, very directly. And I'm wondering if that, uh, that feeling was shared in Syria uh, over the last maybe 50, 60 years, and if that has shifted uh, in a sense. Has that faith uh, dwindled? Has it, has it shifted to other parts of the world? Has Turkey maybe uh, emerged as a place for this kind of faith to be put in, and was that the case before? So I'm curious as to uh, where uh, where in the world the the faith of some uh, of the Syrian folks today uh, stands. I suppose. Yes. Was that clear? <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. I think, and I think. Um, I don't know if Sarah want to add anything, but uh, refugees are uh, a treasure for any country. They can add new things. They can give the society new things. They mix. Uh, they 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 present a new culture, new uh, new values uh, to 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 know about it. Uh, uh, with the with the with the, with the last like five years, I think with the raised uh, raising like. Uh, some kind of uh, sensitivity about the refugee issue in Europe or in 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 uh, the, the the US, people they start to see see like Turkey as uh, more clothes in culture and than the society and more like more comfortable to stay in even with the like uh, they know the 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 the, the gains of like uh, economically or financially that will be better a, a lot in Europe Sweden Germany even the US uh, with a very low number that the the, the US accepted but uh, at the end uh, they the, I know a lot of families that they came back after a very hard trip to Germany and Sweden they struggled and they called to, 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 for, for us to, to pay their tickets and to come back to Turkey because they couldn't, they couldn't actually uh, uh, handle uh, some kind of uh, uh, behaviors that they saw. So they, they had to come back regardless of any like benefits that they get, they, they got there. So. Uh, and this is uh, again. Uh, this is uh, not. Uh, this is not uh, the, the 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 things that we used to uh, like. For most of the countries, that uh, they 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 knew the humanitarians and they the uh, values and they knew the 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 the, the needs for the refugee society. So uh, I think yes, it is. It was changed, and uh, a lot of people uh, they uh, that I know uh, they came back to Turkey uh, with the with the less benefits, but they wanted at least to be welcome and to see some kind of hospitality uh, from the the society. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much, both Khalid and Sarah. Let's have a round of applause.